Hey guys, today we're talking about God's rest or the Sabbath rest. Have you ever heard about the Sabbath rest or the rest of God? Well, this is a place that is reserved, that God has reserved for all true believers and he's calling us all to come there. All right, so let's look, kind of take a big span over the scriptures and look at rest you know, from Genesis forward and kind of see what's going on with this, okay? And mind you, our hearts will always be <clears throat> restless until we rest in God. That's just a fact of the universe. So in this video and in this issue, you need to decide for yourself are you going to enter the rest of God? If not, you need to be willing and and given, you know, warning that and, and notice that your heart is going to be restless for the rest of your life if and until you enter his rest. See, there's no alternative. You're either going to have a restless heart or you're going to enter his rest. Okay, that's one thing we need to just look at. That's just a fact. Okay, so let's look at Genesis 1, verses 2 and 3. What does that say? And on the seventh day, God ended his work. He ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. And God blessed and spoke good of the seventh day. He set it apart as his own. I want you to remember that, that he rested on that day. He set it apart for his own. Okay, that's going to be important. And he caused it to be holy because on it, he rested from all his work, which he had created and done. All right, so we see in... Genesis 1, verse 2 and 3, we see rest, right? We definitely see rest. But who is resting in Genesis? It is God. God is resting from what? From his work. From all of his work. So we in Genesis 1... Verse 2 and 3, we see rest. It is a rest that God is doing. He's actively doing it. And it is on the seventh day. And he is resting from all his work. Okay. Next, what do we see? Let's go to Numbers 13 and 14. Here we see a different scenario. The Lord gave the Israelites some land. Okay, it was the land of Canaan. This was a land flowing with milk and honey. It had fruit. It had everything that they needed. And God said, this is your land. Go take the land. It's yours. Go have it. But the Israelites feared. They had a lot of fear going on. And they feared entering the land. They disobeyed God. And they wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. They were going to stone them. Okay, that's how fearful and angry they were. And the Lord said in response to this, How long will they treat me with contempt? He sees it as contempt when he gives you the land, the Israelites the land, and they say, we're afraid, we won't enter, we're going to go suck our thumbs or, or uh, throw stones at people who are trying to lead us in. How long will they treat me with contempt? And the Lord was going to kill all of them. But Moses, you know, intervened and he kind of reasoned with God and he said, please pardon them, please pardon them. We don't want you to have this bad reputation. So God said, okay, I'm not going to kill them, but they're going to die in the wilderness. They will never, ever enter my land. So God was ticked off. He was very offended, and he wanted to destroy them. See, this is severe. So God gave them the land. It was theirs. 
He said, this is your land. He had already purchased it. And it was theirs. It had the milk and the honey and the fruit, everything they could ever want or need. But they were afraid. Why? Because they were some giants and some Nephilim roaming around there. And they thought it was their land. And so the Israelites were afraid to go into the land and confront these giants. They were afraid that the giants would destroy them, even though the Lord had given them the land. And in that, he had given them the victory over the giants. But the Israelites were very afraid, so they did not enter. They did not enter. So in this rest, in um, not this rest, but this land was a land of type of rest for them because it was a place where they would be free from all their enemies once they slayed the giants, which God was going to help them to do. So this was a physical rest that God was leading them to. It was an actual land, a place that God had reserved for them, created for them and reserved for them. So we see rest here, but it is a physical rest. Just like God's work and this kind of rest was physical over here. So we have rest here, potential rest here, uh, and it would be physical. And who was it for? It was for, not God, but for Israelites. And they said, no, we're not going to go. So they um, showed God contempt. Contempt toward God. Okay. So this is a good thing. This is a bad thing, right? Can just make it real simple. Okay, so we've got God rested from his work. He tries to give his people this land, and they reject it. So they all die in the wilderness. So that was a fail. This is a foreshadowing. This number 13 and 14 is a foreshadowing of what is... Um, the scripture is pointing to how everything points to the cross... I'm always talking about everything points to Jesus and speaks of Jesus and everything points to the cross, just like all the sacrifices in the Old Testament and Old Covenant. They were all pointing to the one final, eternal, perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Likewise, this was pointing to the rest that was coming, the real rest, a different kind of rest. So this was a physical um manifestation or example of what God was pointing to in the future. Okay, next we have Psalm 23. So let's look at Psalm 23. Listen here and see if you can find any verses in Psalm 23 that talk about rest. Okay, and keep in mind this is the shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, with his Sheep, the ones that follow him, the ones that know him, the ones that abide in him. So what does he do with them? How does he treat them? It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. So what's the first thing he does with the sheep? Let's read verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So in verse 2, we see resting lying down in green pastures where they can they can eat he leads me beside the quiet or the still waters and he leads the sheep gently and the waters have to be quiet and still or the sheep will be afraid of course and they won't drink and then they'll get dehydrated and they'll die and then what is verse 3 says it says he refreshes my soul he refreshes my soul. Does that sound like a positive thing? It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But notice that that verse 3 refreshes or restores, some versions say. This verse 3 comes after verse 2. He restores your soul after you rest. If you never rest, your soul will not be restored or refreshed. It can't be. It's just a law of the universe. That's why it's in this order in this psalm. 
He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So do you hear the rest as he's walking through the valley? There's still that sense of rest there. You're with me. So I have nothing to worry about. Then you prepare a table, a feast before me in the presence of my enemies. Even when my enemies are all around me, there's still that rest and that comfort there because he's preparing a table for you. you he anoints your head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. See, there's just abundance and rest. Abundance and rest all throughout this psalm. Six, surely your goodness and love or mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what dwelling in the house of the Lord is. It's rest and abundance. Rest and abundance. It's protection. That's what Psalm 23 is all about. It's the sheep following the shepherd and that's what they get when they follow him. So this whole psalm has a theme, a restful theme of care and abundance. Okay, so we see rest here, definitely, in that verse, but there's also a theme throughout it. You can hear it, can't you? So Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, Come to me. Jesus Christ says, Come to me. I want you to notice that he didn't say, Come to anything else. He didn't say, Come to church. He didn't say, Come to your Bible. He didn't say, Come to doing good deeds, confessing your sins, going to Bible studies, praying, come to praying, come to giving to the poor. He didn't say any of those things. He said, come to me, the living, risen Son of God. Come to me who? All you who are weary and heavy laden. Everyone who is tired, carrying heavy burdens from all different things, mainly the law is what gives you a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. So he's saying, I will cause you to lie down in green pastures and lead you beside the still waters so that I can restore your soul. This is the same thing he's saying here. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. I'll take you out from under the law. I'll teach you about me, what I've done for you, and you won't believe it. And that is how you will be able to rest when you come to Christ, because you will learn of him. And then in verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He doesn't say learn from a sermon or learn from a YouTube video or learn from um, reading the scriptures necessarily or learn from anything else out there. He says, learn from me. Again, the living, risen Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Learn from me. I'm going to teach you. I'm your teacher now. Why? Because I'm gentle and humble in heart. I'm not a harsh taskmaster, he's saying. I'm not prideful. I'm not going to have high standards where you can never please me. That's not Jesus Christ. And you will find rest for your souls. When you come to him and you take his yoke and you learn of him, you will find rest for your souls. So we have rest two times here. In verse 28, there's rest. He says it again. Um, in verse 29, rest again. Then, in verse 30, he says, For my yoke is easy. See, the easy it goes with the gentle and humble in heart. And that's the opposite of weary and burdened, heavy laden. See, he's taking you out from under the law and he's teaching you his grace to follow him. Not a bunch of rules, not a bunch of anything, but just him. So his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His burden is an invoice. It's a piece of paper or a stack of paper that has all the sins you've ever committed in your entire life on it. Every single one. And there is a big red stamp across the page that says paid in full. And that is his light burden for you to carry when you walk with him is a document declaring that you have been set free from sin. Now, that's a light burden. Any other burden than that, you don't need to carry. So do you see the rest, the abundance, the grace? 
especially the rest in this uh, passage. There's a lot of rest here. Easy yoke is restful and the light burden is restful. These all speak of rest. Rest for your souls, not to go to sleep, not to take a nap, not to be lazy, but to have rest for your souls, okay? This is talking about a spiritual and emotional rest here. Spiritual and emotional rest, okay? So now we're going to go over to Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. And that says, well, verse 3 first says, Now we who have believed enter that rest. But verse 4 says, So then there is still awaiting a full and complete Sabbath rest reserved for the true people of God. Not all the people people of God who say they love God, but only for the true sheep. The Sabbath rest is reserved, just like the land was purchased and reserved over here. He's reserved and purchased land for us now, today. Okay? It's reserved for the true people of God. For he who has once entered God's rest also has ceased from the weariness and the pain of human labors. Do you hear the weariness and pain? The the uh, Are you weary and heavily burdened over here? Come to me, I'll give you rest. This is talking about the same thing that Hebrews is talking about. For he who has once entered God's rest, who has come to Christ and rested and taken his yoke, his easy yoke and his light burden, and gotten to know him as he is, not as people say he is, also has ceased from the weariness and pain of human labors just as God rested. Okay, there's a rest here. This is just as God rested. All right, this is important. This goes to Amos 3.3 because how can two people walk together unless they're in agreement? Well, they can't, right? So, if you're not resting, you're not walking, really, with the Lord. So, come down here. This is just as God rested. So, this is referring us also way back over here. God rested in Genesis, and the Holy Spirit's trying to line us up with the Lord. He worked six, day, six days, and he rested on the seventh day. He called that day holy. All right, he ceased from all his labors. So just as God rested from those labors peculiarly his own. And then verse 11, let us, just as God rested on the seventh day, let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter that rest of God. To know it not a head knowledge, but an experiential knowing, a heart knowledge, to know it and experience it for ourselves. Experience it for ourselves so that no one over here may fall or perish in the same kind of unbelief and disobedience into which those in the wilderness fell. So he's looking back and saying, don't do this. Don't do this. I feel the same way about people who refuse to enter my rest, today, as I did back then, they're showing me contempt. They're spitting in my face. That's what he's basically saying. I will not tolerate it. It is absolutely unacceptable. Okay, so over here he's saying, the true believers are coming to rest with Christ. That's what they do. They enter the rest just as God rested. See, the shepherd does something and the true sheep follow him. See, you're lining yourself up with the Lord when you rest. Cease from your labors. You're lining yourself up with the Lord. You're coming and you're getting in the yoke with Christ. 
Let him do the work. You're just walking along with him. He's doing everything. You're just hanging out. You're not stressed. You're not freaking out. You're not worrying. You don't need to. So in looking at all of this, let's notice that number six is the number of fallen man, right? It's a number of like flesh. Number seven, what is that? The number of, number seven. It's the number of perfection or completion. Comp uh, completion or perfection. So let's keep that in mind while we go over these next six parts, uh, verses. Matthew 5, 48 says this. Jesus says this. Be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. You be perfect just as my heavenly Father is perfect. Okay? How are we going to be perfect? Well, if we put that in the context of the Sabbath rest, God rested on the seventh day. And what did he do? He made it holy. Right? The seventh day of rest, which represents rest, and God's perfection is holy. When we come over here and enter the Sabbath rest, which God commands us to do, we are moving from number six, doing our own works, over to number seven. Perfection and completion. That's the number of God he made that day holy and he set it apart to himself. When we come and enter the Sabbath rest by faith, we are declaring ourselves set apart for God. We've moved from number six to number seven. We are holy unto the Lord. That just means we belong to him and he can do whatever he wants with us. It doesn't mean that we you know, have to be so uh, any kind of perfect behavior. We're still human. But you see what I'm saying? Sabbath rest of God, the Sabbath rest of God for us. When we do that, we line ourselves up with God. Also, in John 6, 29, Jesus answered. They were asking him some questions. How do we do the works of God? And he said, the work of God is this. I'm going to tell you what the work of God is. Do you want to know what the work of God is? I'm going to tell you. It's real simple. To believe in the one he has sent. That means believe in me. Listen and follow me. That's how to do the works of God because you're not doing it. I'll be doing the work. See, that's the work of God if God's doing the work. It's not a work of God if you're doing the work. See, that's the goats. The real sheep enter over here to the rest so that God can do the work through them. Now, there's another verse I want to look at, and that is a Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering... Jesus Christ has perfected for all time those being sanctified. When we, when God rested on the seventh day, declared it holy, and that number means perfection, completion, when we enter God's rest over here, we are entering into Hebrews 10, 14. We're saying, by one offering, Jesus Christ has perfected me. I'm still being sanctified in the you know physical body, in this life, in this dimension. But spiritually, I've been perfected because I'm at rest. And that is what is perfect to God. Be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. Well, do what my heavenly Father did. He rested after he worked. And he stayed in the rest. You finish your work and you stay in your rest. Stay in the same rest. You're lining yourself up with him. You're... He says you're perfect when you do this. That's how to be perfect, is to believe and to enter the rest. So Hebrews 4.10 says again, just as God rested, he did it, we're going to follow him over here. Just as God rested in the world's creation, see, he finished creation and then he rested, well, we are going to rest in the Sabbath rest, just as he did, but we're going to rest in the new creation that he has made us. 
See, there's the creation of the earth and everything that was involved in creation, and then he rested, and then there is the new nature, the new creation that God has created in us, who we are now, and we rest in that. Okay? We rest in the new creation that we are now. So when we rest in Christ or in God, we're lining ourselves up with him, and when you rest, you are standing fully, fully, both feet in, whole heart in, Christ. And in that, you are complete and perfect in God's eyes because you become number seven. You move from number six to number seven. You're not doing the work yourself. You're not uh, struggling and trying to make yourself righteous before him. You know, this self-righteousness and all this mumbo-jumbo, this nonsense. You're like, no, I'm going to trust the Savior. I'm moving down to number seven because I got both feet in the new covenant. I got both feet in Jesus Christ. I don't even have my own feet anymore. I don't trust myself. I don't want my flesh. I don't, it just has nothing to do with it. I'm in the Lord. And that makes you complete and perfect in God's eyes. Okay, Matthew 5, 48, John 6, 29, Hebrews 4, 10, and Hebrews 10, 14. So I want to just say, too, that this number up here, number six, is your own work, your own fire. Hello. I did a video on your own fire, and there's a post on my blog, too, on that very serious. Number six is self-effort. Number six is independence from God. Number six is ego. It's the pride of man. This is all yucky. We don't want that. Number seven, on the contrary, is God's work. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit working. It is surrender. It is dependence on the Lord. I can't do this, Lord. You do it. You'll do it through me because I know I can't do it. There's no question that I can do it. So it's resolved. You're teaching this class. It's resolved. You're doing this video. It's resolved. You're going to have to do everything because I'm not living this life. I can't do it and I won't do it. It's dependence on Christ. It is resting in Christ. Resting in Christ. Resting in Christ. Rest, rest, rest. And it is humility. That's what dependence on Christ is. It's humility. Okay? So Hebrews 4 says, So that you don't fall or perish by the same unbelief and disobedience. So my recommendation for you is to examine your heart. Say, Lord, would you please deal with me? Because I don't know what this is all about, but if you command me to do it, then I want to do it. Examine your heart and discern what is holding you back from God's rest. Okay? The Israelites were, were held back over here by what? Fear. Right? So if the fear held them back, then there's fear holding you back over here. Is there fear? Why haven't you entered the rest? Have you never heard about it? Well, maybe you've never heard about it. Maybe you didn't know we were, we were commanded to do that. Or maybe you've heard, but you've resisted. Or you've heard, but you thought, oh no, I've got to get the glory. I've got to do my work. I don't want God to do the work, and I don't want Him to get the glory. I don't know what your heart is saying subconsciously, but you need to deal with your heart. So is a giant or a Nephilim frightening you from entering God's rest over here? Ask the Lord what the fear is that's holding you back from entering. Ask him to expose the Nephilim or the giant that is spooking you or intimidating you or what the lie is. The, the giant or the Nephilim could be a big lie that you're believing. So if the Israelites wouldn't enter because of fear over here, it's fear that's blocking you if you won't enter or afraid to enter over here. So ask the Lord to reveal to you the fear that grips you so that you can throw it off and enter. It's wide open. It's wide open. All the sheep need to come in. So, and then also remember that Hebrews 4.11 says to exert yourself. 
strive to enter the rest, make every effort. And so in that, it's telling us that this not this is not natural for us to enter this rest. Why? Because we're supposed to achieve and show off and be all that. That's how we're taught from childhood, right? But God's saying, no, 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 no. This is, this is the opposite. It's like we've been pedaling a bicycle backwards our whole lives, and he's trying to teach us to pedal forward now. And we think, what are you doing? This makes no sense. But this is what, what would have been great if we had learned it from the beginning. Okay? It's not natural for us to enter the, the Sabbath rest, but it is a spiritual necessity. A spiritual necessity. And I believe that's why in Matthew 25, when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, the goats come up and they've done all these things. They've done all these impressive things, spiritual things, good deeds. Oh, they have a long list. Well, we did all these things for you. The problem is that the goats never entered the rest of God. They never entered the rest of God. So all the work was done by them, not the Holy Spirit, and they got all the glory. God didn't get the glory because it wasn't his work. So... If you don't enter the rest, the Holy Spirit is blocked in many ways from working through you, and then God does not, definitely does not get all the glory. So all this to say that if you are a true sheep of the living God, you really love the Lord and you want his will in your life and you are seeking him and you know you want to be in eternity in heaven, his heaven then you're a true sheep, then you must enter the Sabbath rest. So if you want, I will say a prayer so that you can use it as an example or modify it or make up one of your own that you can just pray, Lord Jesus, I love you. I've given my life to you. I've surrendered everything to you. I don't know what you want from me, but I'm trusting that you're going to show me and you're going to lead me in your ways. I know that in your word, you command me to enter the Sabbath rest. I'm not really sure what this is, uh, but I ask that you teach me about it. And I ask that you lead me into this rest, that you cause me to, be, to do whatever striving I need to do to enter it because I want to enter it. And I want everything that is blocking me from entering it to be removed so that I can enter it. And then you say, I trust you to do that. Help me to be aware of what you're, where you're working in my life and what you're telling me. And then you thank him and you say, in Jesus' name, amen. That is just an example of a prayer you could pray for him to, to him about this. Okay, so this is a summary of the Sabbath rest or God's rest. God rested on the seventh day. We are to line ourselves up with him as the Holy Spirit allows us to. So he rested from all of his work, declared the day holy, set it apart. How do we line ourselves up with that? We enter the Sabbath rest just as God rested. When you enter the Sabbath rest, you're following the Lord. You're lining yourself up with the Lord even more. And you're refusing to do what the Israelites did over here, which royally ticked him off and he was going to kill them. Okay, That's how he feels about this. Do you think it would be important to enter the rest? Well, let's not do this. This is a big no, no, no. So he's telling us to come over here and rest, that this is his will for us. Just like the shepherd leads the sheep in a restful way to lie down. And when you do that, he will restore your soul and all other kinds of good things happen. Okay? And this is the same thing Jesus says in um, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me. I'm the good shepherd. I will lead you to rest because I'm going to make you lie down in the pasture. Calm down. Everything's in fine. I'm, I'm in charge. It's going to be okay. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to give you everything you need. Enough already. Just I'm going to take care of everything. That's what he's saying. And when you come over here, you're saying, okay, yes, I believe you. I want you to live your life through me. I want you to do everything, and I'm just going to follow, listen, and follow. And I'm not going to expect anything. I'm just going to watch and let you do your thing. There are no expectations on me because I'm not God. You're God. So I'm expecting things from you. Okay? This is the release that you want in your spiritual and emotional life. This is a spiritual rest. 
Over here, it was a physical rest. This is a spiritual rest. It is an emotional rest. It is a rest from striving and trying. It is a rest from self-righteousness. Okay, I don't want to go on too long on this because I can go crazy on some of these topics. But just to keep it short, this is a summary on the Sabbath rest. And I pray that you will enter that rest. And I pray that in the name of Jesus. So I'll see you guys next time.